So you guys overlapped while you were in Finland, I guess. Yeah. Um, we were in the same lab. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, I think Jen, it's working. So I suppose everybody is, uh, can talk uh, or unmute themselves or yeah so we try to keep most of the questions by the end of the talk uh but if there is any pressing questions people can jump in yeah. and ask so you're going to be speaking around like 25 minutes i guess yeah it should be 25 minutes i hope i i won't pay over time no worries um Jen, let me know when you want to start because it's already 11.01. I mean, yeah, okay. people I've trickle in. The, we... Everything is set up. So we are ready on the technology side for whenever <laughs> you're ready. Uh, Jenna, if you go, you know, go ahead and put your slide up, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. Awesome. Let me find my notes quickly. Okay. Hello everyone and welcome for another session of Cell Migration Seminar. We are excited to have two wonderful speakers today. First, we are going to have Dr. Jonna Alanko. Uh, she did her PhD from um, Professor Jonna Ivaska's lab in University of Turku, where she studied integrin trafficking and integrin endosomal fact signaling and its role in cancer metastasis. After that, she moved to um, she moved kind of her field to less adhesive leukocytes and did her postdoc in Professor Michael Six's lab. I think that's the work she's basically going to be talking about today, uh, where she studied dendritic, uh, dendritic cell chemotaxis and cell generated chemokine gradients. Uh, she recently moved back to Finland and is currently working in the lab of Professor Marco Salmi, an immunology center called Inflames in University of Turku. With this, I would like to give a uh, stage to Janna and we are so, so excited to you for you to speak and listen to your work, Janna. Thank you so much. And thank you so much uh, for the introduction and also uh, thank you for giving me the chance to present our work here today. So, um, yeah, so this was done in Professor Mihal's sixth group in Institute of Science and technology uh, where we try to understand how leukocytes move in different environments and upon different chemokine stimuli. And I was especially interested uh, about dendritic cells, so shortly DCs, which are actually one of the fastest moving cells in our bodies. And uh, here's just an example of mouse dendritic cell migrating uh, with LIFAC GFP. Um, just to give you an idea how dynamic these cells actually are. And so for those who are not so familiar with these, so these are called professional antigen presenting cells, uh, which basically means that these cells are constantly kind of crawling all over in our bodies, uh, patrolling and searching for pathogens. And once they find something, uh, this triggers uh, a maturation program in them and then after this, the only mission for these cells is to find their way to the nearest lymph vessel as fast as possible, and then take the antigen uh, further to lymph nodes to present it to T cells and thereby then uh, trigger the whole uh, adaptive immune response. And so you see that efficient dendritic cell is quite, dendritic cell migration is quite critical for our health. And upon this maturation, uh, the cells start to express a GPCR called CCR7. And this uh, receptor has two different ligands. So uh, sticky, immobile, uh, CCL21, which is mostly secreted by the endothelial cells surrounding uh, lymph vessels. And then the soluble CCL19, uh, which has a bigger role uh, than in the lymph nodes. And um, so the rest of the talk, I will talk about the soluble CCL19 and the mature dendritic cells. But so basically, uh, by following these uh, chemokines, dendritic cells then find their way from the tissues to lymph nodes. And chemotaxis, uh, as we know, is a fundamental process from bacteria to mammals. Uh, so the movement towards higher attractant concentration. 
And so this polarized ligand binding leads to polarized actin polymerization and then uh, to directed cell migration. However, uh, chemotaxis is, is not as simple as often actually thought, uh, especially in vivo and over long distances. And this is because the chemotaxis efficiency is critically dependent on the attracted correct uh, attractant concentration. And uh, so gradients have been found to be most efficient when the, the chemokine concentration is close to the KD of the receptor. So basically when half of the receptors are occupied. And so what this means then is that uh, if the chemokine concentration is too low, the cells don't really know where to go because they cannot really see it. And then on the other hand, if the concentration is too high, uh, all the receptors get saturated and then the cells are lost again. And actually even in an ideal uh, or a perfect gradient, uh, if the cells just migrate long enough, uh, eventually all the receptors should get saturated and then the cells kind of get lost. And yeah, this is exactly what we see, for instance, with neutrophils. So here's a movie of uh, neutrophils migrating in collagen towards their uh, attractant FMLP. And I hope you can see here in the movie that so initially the cells are kind of responding well to this attractant. So they kind of start uh, migrating towards the top part, but then they lose this directionality extremely fast and then get kind of random. And this can be seen also here in this quantification uh, showing the migration speed uh, towards the chemokine source. While then um, in contrast, uh, dendritic cells with CCL19 uh, behave quite differently. So if you see here in the movie, these cells in contrast kind of uh, just keep migrating extremely persistent over long distances and, and very long time periods. So they just keep going upwards. And this is clear also in the quantification down here. And so the question is then that what we're wondering like, how do dendritic cells then do this? And we started thinking that maybe these cells are somehow getting adapted to this higher chemokine concentration, or maybe they could even change the gradient somehow. And so to look at this, uh, we switched to this uh, classical under Agaro's essay, which is used a lot uh, in the field. Uh, mainly because uh, dendritic cells grow in suspension. So you cannot just throw those uh, on a dish uh, like many other cells. And so here the cells are allowed to migrate under a layer of agarose. Uh, so here uh, towards the, the chemokine. And here's just an example to show how the cells look like under agarose. Uh, so these are now live active FB expressing cells um, migrating towards uh, CCL19. Uh, however, in uh, most of our essays, we only use nuclear staining uh, to make the quantification and tracking easier. So to look at then uh, whether uh, dendritic cells could, could even kind of change the gradient somehow, uh, we allow the cells to migrate towards CCL19 gradient in this under setup, or then uh, in a uniform CCL19, where the same amount of chemokine was mixed uh, in the acarose. And then we looked, uh, here are the movies and the nuclear staining. So to our surprise, uh, the cells seem to migrate as efficiently, uh, no matter whether they were in a gradient or in a uniform CCL19. So it didn't seem to make any difference. And uh, this we could also see here in the quantification. So if anything, it seemed that the cells are actually doing a bit better with the uniform CCL19. And this was uh, dependent on CCR7. So the knockout cells did not migrate and also cells without any chemokine didn't move. Uh, so this was clearly uh, specific. And so this means that dendritic cells need to somehow then create their own gradient uh, since they can migrate in the uniform chemokine field. And yeah, the idea of cells making their own gradients is not new. 
uh, quite opposite, actually. And we've heard about these self-generated gradients uh, also previously in this seminar uh, series um, from Robert Insel, who has several great papers about the subject. And so here, uh, the idea is that the cells are somehow locally depleting their attractants when they are moving. And then this uh, leads to local gradients and, and to directed uh, collective migration. And there are an uh, increasing number of examples of these gradients in different cells and in different organisms. Um, here's uh, an example, one of uh, Luke Tweedis and Robert Insel's paper uh, showing how dicta cells enzymatically degrade their attractant. And then also Darren Gilmore's and Holger Knott's groups have shown that in Zephyrfis, the lateral line primordial migration is directed by uh, SDF1 um, gradients that the cells themselves do. And uh, more recently, of course, Adam Schellard also showed that uh, also self-generated stiffness gradients uh, exist. And so, uh, but in all, all these previous examples, there was kind of always two different components. So there was the other one kind of doing the sinking and the other one kind of doing the sensing. And uh, in our dendritic cells, we didn't find any uh, known scavenger receptors, but what was known uh, or shown previously in other cells was that CCR7 uh, can, or is actually endocytosed upon ligand binding and the endocytosis is dynamin and clatrin dependent. And so this of course, uh, could be uh, a potential mechanism how the cells could uh, generate these gradients. And indeed, also in our cells, we could see that uh, labeled CCL19 was nicely endocytosed by the cells and localized in these small vesicles. And uh, also, when we mix the fluorescent uh, chemokine with the cells in a tube, we could see um, an increased uptake of the chemokine over time. Uh, and then in line with this, uh, we could see a decrease in, of the chemokine in the surrounding medium. And this was clearly CCR7 uh, dependent because CCR7 knockout cells could not do this. But whether this uh, kind of seemingly small uh, depletion is then enough to actually guide migration and um, to check that, uh, we did this modified under a girl's essay where we had uh, three holes. So CCL19 on one side alone, then CCL19 plus cells on the other cells. So these cells we called like the sink cells. And then we had small number of, of cells in the middle uh, called center cells. And then we imaged uh, which way these cells are migrating. And so if the cells here uh, in the sink would not be able to sink enough uh, the chemokine, uh, the central cells should go like 50-50 to both directions. But then if the sink sinking is uh, efficient and, and enough, the central cells should go more towards the, the chemokine only hole. And so what we then saw was that when we had CCR7 knockout cells uh, in the sink, the sensor cells went like 50-50 to both sides, uh, while if we had the wild type cells uh, sinking, they depleted the chemokine so much that the sensor cells went exclusively towards the, the chemokine only hole here. So clearly the cells are able to deplete, uh, deplete uh, adequate amounts of chemokine. But whether this then, yeah, how about then, uh, this kind of collective migration behavior we saw in the uniform CCL19, that, that is this also dependent on uh, chemokine depletion? And actually answering this question uh, was quite difficult uh, because if we think that the same receptor is responsible both for the sinking and the sensing, uh, like separating these two functions can be quite difficult. But in theory, if we block the sinking, uh, the cells should still be able to migrate in a gradient CCL19. And so this is kind of where we were aiming for. And as I mentioned uh, previously, CCR7 had been shown to undergo this dynamin and clatrin mediated endocytosis uh, 
in other cells. And so we first uh, tried all these uh, different classical endocytic inhibitors, endocytosis inhibitors. Uh, but the problem with all those was that they also compromised the migration in a gradient CCL19, uh, probably due to other receptors like interkrins. And so then we couldn't really say anything specifically about the sinking. So we went uh, back to these images and uh, then we realized that actually the labeled chemokine was always uh, kind of localized at the back of the cell. And, and we started to think that, that maybe this CCR7 endocytosis could actually be somehow linked to the retraction uh, of the back of the cell when they migrate and this contractility. And so then this led us to, uh, to LFC, which is a GEF for row A and a murine homolog of GEF H1. And the, the reason for this is that uh, a, a PhD student previously in the group, uh, Aklayakov, uh, showed that uh, in our cells, uh, LFC was actually important for the actomyosin contractility at the back of the cell and for the rare retraction. And she could also show, uh, showed here uh, in this beautiful movie, that LFC uh, in our cells localized really at the back when the cells were moving. And so this uh, then led us to think or test whether LFC could actually have a role in CCR7 endocytosis. And I wouldn't talk about it if it wouldn't have a role there. So <laughs> clearly, uh, so when we were looking at uh, the cell surface level of CCR7 upon CCL19 stimuli, uh, we could see that um, LFC uh, knockout cells had reduced uh, CCR7 endocytosis. And in line with this, also the LFC knockout cells could not take uh, as much uh, CCL19 or endocytos uh, it at, as efficiently as, as shown here in the example pictures and also in this quantification. But most importantly, the LFC knockout cells were still able to migrate just fine in gradient CCL19. So here's maximum projections of uh, LFC wild type and knockout cells from 10 hour movie. And so you see that uh, the migration is uh, as good as with the wild type cells. And so now we finally had a tool where CCR7 endocytosis and sinking is compromised, but the migration in uh, gradient CCL19 is still working normally. And so when we then place these cells in a uniform CCL19, uh, what we saw was what we kind of hoped for, is that um, the LFC knockout cells had big problems uh, migrating in uniform CCL19, as shown here and here in the quantification. And so this shows that um, this um, CCR7 mediated uh, CCL19 uptake is uh, critical for cells to create gradients, uh, the CCL19 gradients, and therefore migrate in this uniform uh, CCL19 field. To get further proof and to also predict some uh, consequences of this migration, we collaborated with two uh, fantastic theoreticians at IST, so Edward Hanso and uh, postdoc in his group uh, Mehmet Ukar, who created this particle-based uh, simulation uh, for cells migrating in initially uniform CC uh, uh, chemokine field. And I'm not going uh, into details of this model, but if you have some specific questions, uh, Mehmet is in the audience and is uh, promised to address the questions after this talk. But so just briefly, so here uh, cells were modeled as polar particles, which were uh, performing a persistent random walk and uh, locally depleting the attractant. And then the cells were experiencing two different kinds of forces. So uh, chemotactic force, <clears throat> and then also a repulsive uh, force from the neighboring cells. Hmm. And so the simulation uh, sorry, reproduced our experimental data very well. Uh, so as shown here in these tracks of cells uh, or particles migrating in uniform CCL19, and the, the simulation also uh, 
accurately kind of capture the cell density and velocity profiles that we got from the experiments, the velocity decreasing over time and, and cell, cell density kind of propagating from the cell source. But most importantly, the simulation showed that if the cells would not be able to degrade uh, the attractant or not to sense it, the cells would not move anywhere. And so this was perfectly in line with our data with the CCR7 and the LFC knockout cells. So then we were wondering uh, what this is good for, this migration. And inspired by uh, Insel's, late, <laughs> Insel's group, uh, latest paper uh, about DICT cells solving mazes, we were wondering uh, whether our dendritic cells could also do the same. And so for this, uh, we designed this simple uh, BDMS device where we had these uh, small channels leading either to a closed channel or an open, sorry, closed end or open end, which leads to a big uh, chemokine reservoir. And then we filled the whole device with uniform CCL19 and, and placed the cells here. And so the idea is that the cells basically by depleting, if they are able to uh, make these uh, gradients, they should be able to kind of deplete the chemokine from this closed end before actually even entering there and thereby find their way towards the open end. And we were very excited to see that this is exactly what our dendritic cells do. Uh, so as shown here in this maximum projections, so the dendritic cells, uh, almost all cells uh, found the, the open end. And this was also uh, the same could be seen also in the simulation. Uh, CCR7 knockout cells, uh, on the other hand, uh, could not do this. So here's the wild type cells and here are the knockout cells. So only a few of these uh, knockout cells which cannot uh, see or endocytose the chemokine uh, only few of them uh, came in, and, and even these ones just went randomly, like 50-50 to both sides. And the same was uh, true with the LFC knockout cells. So, so these cells couldn't really enter because, as we showed, these cells cannot really create the gradient. And only when we reduce the, general, the overall uh, chemokine concentration um, and use like five times less, CCL19, we could get the same number of cells, LFC knockout and wild type cells, uh, reaching the, the kind of decision point in the devices. But even then, uh, uh, the knockout cells made significantly more mistakes in finding the open channel. And so this shows that uh, dendritic cells are able to avoid upcoming obstacles with these self generated uh, gradients. And well, then finally, we were wondering uh, whether the dendritic cells uh, could also guide the migration of T cells with these uh, self made CCL19 gradients. And this is because uh, dendritic cells and T cells naturally uh, interact in the lymph nodes, where also CCL19 is present. And T cells also express uh, low levels of CCR7. And so to see this, uh, we labeled dendritic cells and, and T cells differently, and then uh, allowed these cells to co-migrate in a uniform CCL19 under acarose. And so T cells are kind of making these constant uh, short interactions with dendritic cells, uh, which are CCR7 independent. And so this is why, as shown here, um, also the CCR7 knockout T cells are kind of, to some extent, tracked by the dendritic cells forward. But still, uh, when we mixed uh, wild type T cells with dendritic cells, we could, in addition to this population, we could see a lot of T cells kind of in front of dendritic cells, um, as I hope you can see here. And actually, these cells in migrating in front of DCs these were even more persistent than cells migrating alone, T cells alone in uniform CCL19 or even in a gradient CCL19. And so this kind of shows that, that uh, dendritic cells are able to create the CCL19 
uh, gradients and thereby also guide the migration of T cells, uh, which could have a, a, an important role uh, in vivo in lymph nodes. And so, uh, as a summary, uh, we think that dendritic cells are able to create their own CCL19 gradients by CCR7 mediated uh, endocytosis. And uh, thereby, uh, this allows the cells to migrate long distances and be less uh, dependent on external gradients. And also, uh, with the self made CCL19 gradients, uh, dendritic cells are able to navigate and in different environments, avoid these upcoming obstacles and also guide the migration of T cells. And finally, uh, I would uh, like to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this work. So of course, uh, Mihal Sixth and all the sixties, uh, especially Nika, Julian and Ingrid, of course, uh, Mehmet and Edward for the theory part, uh, Jack Marin, uh, uh, for the help with the PDMS device and uh, IST and IST imaging facility in general. Uh, thank you for the funding agencies. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jana. Uh, while people put questions in, I ac actually quickly had a question. Um, I was wondering how are you trying to link um, the GEF with uh, the endocytosis phenotype, like, um, you know, if you have some hypothesis behind that or any mechanistic information that I'm missing. Yeah, so that is, oh, should I stop sharing the slides? It's up to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so that was maybe uh, a bit surprising uh, why we came for, <laughs> started to think about LFC. Uh, but so the um, idea was basically that uh, this contractility at the back uh, was dependent on LFC, where we also see that the chemokine is kind of, the internalized chemokine localizes. So that was kind of first, um, maybe a bit of wild guess, and uh, which turned out to be uh, exactly kind of the type of tool that we wanted, because we needed something that where the endocytosis of CCR7 and the chemokine was kind of uh, inhibited, but still that the cells would migrate in chemokine gradient. And I think like afterwards thinking that, uh, I think there are some uh, evidence from other papers that um, that actomyosin contractility at the back of the cell could be important for receptor endocytosis. Uh, think, so do you think the yeah. uptake is mostly happening at the back or is it just the uptake is happening everywhere, but you know, it gets accumulated at the back. Yeah, so this uh, actually we we cannot say, so we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. For the for this model to work, it doesn't matter uh, whether it comes from the, like where the endocytosis occurs. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Leonard has a question. Leonard, if you want to go. Neon. Hello, yes, hi. Uh, absolutely that. brilliant talk. Really, really cool. Uh, I had oh, a question uh, about the role of decoy receptors. Is that something that is relevant in your system or or not? Yeah, so these kind of scavenger receptors. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we we were checking the RNA sequencing data of our dendritic cells and we couldn't find any known scavengers uh, from our cells. And then um, also because we could see that if, uh, in CCR7 knockout cells, the uh, chemokine was not internalized. So I think we like then we concluded that that uh, there is no at least scavenger receptors don't have a big part in that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And can I just sort of follow up on that? What do you think happens to the the chemokines that are taken up? Are they degraded and removed from the receptor, or does the receptor and the chemokine together get degraded? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, we didn't check it, but uh, so based on the previously uh, published data from, I think mainly hex cells uh, from Daniel Leckler's group, uh, they show that uh, the chemokine is taken to degradation and then the receptor is recycled back to the plasma membrane, which often happens with uh, many, many lichens. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks.
We have a lot of um, good questions coming in through the um, through the chat um, from Robert Fuller O'Brien asking if other myeloid cells also create gradients like the dendritic cells. Um, do monocytes that infiltrate inflamed tissues generate a gradient for CCR5 positive cells? Yeah, this is a great question and an interesting one. So uh, indeed, so this is kind of the first time that self-generated gradients have been seen in in white blood cells in leukocytes uh, so so far there hasn't been any any reports uh, on that but um i i think like this that the a lot of these receptors are known to internalize their lichens which often are taken to degradation so i would be surprised if this wouldn't be a more general thing it's just that it was kind of previously sort of ignored that what happens to the surrounding chemokine field when when the cells are kind of taking it up, and so yeah, it would be nice to to look at also these uh, monocytes and and other cells. Awesome. Um, next question is from Janik Berhard asking what happens to the surface bound CLL oh, sorry CCL twenty one and can dendritic cells deplete that though. <laughs> Again, very good question. Uh, so actually, um, I started this whole work by looking at CCL21, uh, <laughs> but uh, it somehow turned uh, into this 19 story. Uh, but so, um, so I was looking at CCL21 in um, binding to cell-derived matrices because it's known in vivo to bind matrices. It's very sticky. And uh, based on some... Uh, unpublished uh, data, uh, I, I think that dendritic cells are able to create also gradients on CCL21, but the mechanism is, is a bit different. So I, I think there um, it's the cells are, because it's known that dendritic cells can cleave CCL21 C terminus and then release it uh, into the medium. So I think this cleavage um, has a, a bigger role there. So kind of like cow eating the grass. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Raphael Petrosian. Um, so thanks for the interesting talk. Um, while in the maze, some, uh, though very few of the wild type dendritic cells went onto the closed path. Is there an explanation for that? Also in the simulations of the same process, many cells moved to the right, the closed path, but they didn't turn onto that path. And so uh, do you have any insights about that? Yeah, so we if I understood it right, but yeah, we see kind of like that the cells uh, in these horizontal channels are kind of going both sides and then kind of tur turning maybe and going towards the open. I think this is uh, just because kind of, um, actually I'm surprised that more cells is not going to the, the closed end because it's, it's still kind of a big uh, volume that the cells need to kind of clear out from the chemokine. Uh, in order to create the gradient towards the open. So I think um, this is kind of a matter of, of the volume and length of the channel that how much the cells go there before they realize that go the other way. <laughs> awesome. Um, next question is from Teresa Jacuzit asking, how much does this affect on the cell concentration? Example, did you reduce the cell concentration in Agaro's PAD experiment? and still observe the effect? Or also another part of the question is, do you have an estimate of cell concentrations in different parts of the body? Uh, okay, so uh, if I answer the second part first, so no, I, I don't have an estimate how many cells there are in different parts of the body, but, but in lymph nodes, uh, I could imagine that this would maybe have a bigger role in lymph nodes where kind of the cells are quite concentrated and packed and perhaps also like um, resolving maybe infections or where like there's initially like a, a group of cells and then need to go away but yeah I don't know exact numbers uh, then I forgot already the first part <laughs> uh, is asking okay. is if there is an effect of the cell concentration ah, when you indeed. do under agarose yeah yes yeah, so this is actually something that um, the simulations predicted and, and made us to then test experimentally. 
uh, that whether the chemokine or sorry whether the cell number affects uh, the the migration efficiency and we did see that it's dependent on the cell density so uh, the the lower the higher the cell density the more kind of uh, directional the the cells are and this kind of makes sense because if of course like uh, if there's only few cells, they cannot really make a strong gradient and, and then are less persistent. All right, thank you. Um, Jana, you have a couple more questions, but if you could go and um, maybe answer them in the chat, because um, mm -hmm. I want to actually move on in the interest of time. We're going a bit over. Um, Carla, in the meantime, if you want to start um, sharing your slides uh, while I introduce you. So thank you, um, Dr. Alonco, for that fantastic presentation. That was really exciting and interesting work. And I'm really excited to now introduce our second speaker for today. Um, we're delighted to welcome Professor Carla G. Silva. She did her PhD at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, where she studied the influence of neurotransmission in the developing brain and the formation of hippocampal, ne hippocampal networks. Um, Carla went on to do a postdoctoral research um, at the Laboratory of Molecular Regulation of Neurogenesis in Belgium. And there she focused on the molecular regulation of interneuron migration. And so she actually just recently joined the Translational Neuroscience Department at UMC Utrecht in the Netherlands um, in April 2022. And there her lab studies cell migration in the developing brain. And so I believe um, we'll be hearing about a mix of uh, that work today. So Carla, I'm uh, excited to hand the floor over to you and hear about your work. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, my talk will be a mix of cell biology and also neuroscience. So please don't hesitate to stop me if you need some more uh, background. So uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in uh, this population of uh, cells, interneurons, that are the inhibitory cells of the brain. And uh, they comprise 20% uh, of the uh, total number of neurons. And their function is, uh, they have many, many functions to regulate the excitability of projection neurons, but also to form, uh, to generate rhythms in the brain. And we now identified many uh, subtypes of interneurons, and this, uh, uh, this classification keeps uh, getting more and more complex due to uh, new single cell uh, technologies. Um, so we know that we have interneurons uh, that uh, have distinct morphology, they also connect different compartments of uh, projection neurons, as you can see here. Some are specialized in targeting uh, the dendrites, others the soma, and others the axon. And in terms of physiology, uh, they can have different patterns uh, of uh, electrophysiological uh, activity. But what is interesting is that all uh, this diversity of interneurons uh, is born in uh, uh, subcortical structures. And what you see here is the developing brain, embryonic brain. And uh, under the cortex, you have a mass uh, of tissue that contains progenitors that can give rise to different cells. And the entirety of the cortical and hippocampal cells are born in the medial ganglionic eminence, this structure that you see in blue. Uh, and then these cells uh, take a long path towards the cortex during embryonic development in the mouse. Uh, but this medial ganglionic eminence is not the only structure to generate cortical interneurons. Uh, the caudal ganglionic eminence generates also um, a fraction of these cells. But as you can see here in this representation, the medial ganglionic eminence will generate a uh, deep layer inter uh, interneurons. So as you know, the cortex is divided in six layers and uh, the interneurons generated by the medial ganglionic eminence uh, they will populate deeper layers, while uh, the caudal ganglionic eminence will generate more uh, interneurons that will populate the superficial layers of the cortex. Uh, but uh, all the different uh, uh, types of interneurons will move in a very, uh, in a very stereotypical way. So they have uh, a leading process that will uh, sense the environment. So these cortical interneurons are attracted by 6L12, uh, that is uh, released by intermediate progenitors uh, in the cortex. And uh, there is the formation of a swelling uh, 
and suddenly the nucleus will uh, move into the swelling in the process that is called nucleokinesis and the, the cell will progress forward. And as you can see here, uh, all this process of interneuron migration is highly regulated, but uh, we now know uh, quite well how nucle nucleokinesis uh, proceeds. So uh, it depends on the generation of actomyosin contraction at the nuclear, nuclear uh, rear. So we believed for a long time that uh, uh, the process of migration uh, was very uniform. So all the cells uh, would move in a similar way. Uh, but my uh, past work, in fact, uh, showed uh, that you have different flavors of migration. And I'm not going to talk into detail about this. This is uh, my work from 2018. We show that, uh, in fact, uh, the regulation um, of the pauses uh, on interneurons is mediated by a protein called cytosolic carboxypeptidase 1 that has the ability to degrade the C-terminal of myosin light chain kinase, the enzyme that promotes actomyosin contraction. And uh, when cells lose this uh, control, they will keep moving. So basically what uh, we are generating is an interneuron that will move by sliding instead of jumping and pausing uh, all along. And we could also show interestingly that just by converting uh, the migration mode of interneurons, we can alter the rate of cortical invasion. So in fact, these pauses during migration, interneuron migration are very important to regulate the size of population moving towards the cortex. So the pauses in these cells function as traffic lights uh, in our real life. And this was really interesting. And we could also show that uh, by mobilizing more interneurons just by changing their migration mode, we would interfere with the process of cortic uh, corticogenesis. And uh, we could also show that this happens because more interneurons will create a, um, a higher gradient uh, of a molecule that we still uh, did not identify, but that leads to the proliferation, hyperproliferation of uh, intermediate progenitors. And so in this animal in which you recruit more interneurons, uh, we have also generation of more projection neurons. And this story was also very interesting because it really shows that you have a coordination between the inhibitory component of the brain and the excitatory component of the brain. So the two processes are uh, linked and regulated. If you are bringing more interneurons, inhibitory cells to the cortex, the cortex also compensates by generating more excitatory neurons. So this was uh, very interesting. Uh, but what I'm going to talk today is about a very peculiar uh, interaction between the two cell populations, interneurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells, uh, that starts occurring already um, at the medial ganglionic eminence where interneurons are born. So this, this is a, um, a picture uh, showing a piece of the medial ganglionic eminence. So uh, this part here is lining the ventricle and uh, these green cells uh, are progenitor cells that will give rise to interneurons. But as you can see, they all share uh, and express markers of oligodendrocyte precursor cells, meaning that these progenitors have the potential to also generate glial cells. And this is very striking, right? Because we usually associate oligodendrocyte precursor cells to the process of myelination that occurs very late during development. Um, so um, we were very fascinated by this and we decided to take over um, this project, also knowing uh, from previous literature that uh, in fact, uh, you can have a repression of interneuron fates by olic one transcription factor. And uh, in uh, knockout animals in which you lose this uh, oligo one transcription factor, you have an increased generation of interneurons towards the cortex. And in fact, uh, Nicoleta Kesaris uh, in London uh, was the first one to start uh, studying the generation of these early born OPCs. So uh, Nicoleta described two embryonic waves of OPC generation 
in the ganglionic eminences. So the first one uh, generated by uh, progenitors that express NKX2.1 transcription factor uh, that uh, are proliferating in the medial ganglionic eminence and a second wave from GSH2 uh, domains um, that are uh, expressed in the lateral ganglionic eminence. And finally, a third wave that is postnatal, and it's the wave that will generate uh, almost the majority of the myelinating um, cells, uh, is uh, generated in the cortex itself from EMX1 uh, progenitors. So um, this uh, paper of Nicoletta, as you can see here, was published in 2006, but no one really studied this question further because Nicoletta described that this early population of oligodendrocyte precursor cells is transient and it's eliminated shortly after birth in, uh, at around uh, P15 in the mouse. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, during that short life, these early born OPCs will form some synapses with interneurons uh, in the cortex. So we decided to uh, uh, investigate investigate what is happening before the formation of these synapses. So we started by doing very simple experiments. Uh, what you see here are uh, brain slices of the embryonic brain, uh, half of the brain, right, at E11.5 and here E13.5. And uh, we did some staining, skull binding, that you see in uh, red, that is labeling uh, these uh, interneurons that are being generated. And in green, you have the oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And uh, when you analyze the relative distribution of the two populations, what you can see is that the two populations are usually uh, separated. They are segregated in the tissue. And even when you look at later stages, you see that uh, you still have some segregation of the two populations. Um, and But when you look uh, in the cortex already at uh, E13.5, you see that you have these beautiful corridors of interneurons, but in between these corridors, you have uh, some oligodendrocyte precursor cells that have a, a very irregular distribution. And this happens because oligodendrocyte precursor cells move on blood vessels. So basically they are distributed uh, along blood vessels that have an irregular uh, distribution in the brain. And that's why oligodendrocyte precursor distribution is also irregular. So they don't form these beautiful corridors uh, that interneurons uh, form. And these corridors are formed because there is a gradient of 6L12 uh, under the, on the tissue itself. And you can see here that at a later stage uh, at mid embryogenesis, these oligodendrocyte precursor cells already reach the cortical plate. So here uh, you are in a, in a stage that precedes the formation of the cortex. Uh, only uh, after mid embryogenesis, you start forming the cortex here, uh, that is uh, above uh, the region that is crossed by uh, fibers of the thalamus. And you can see that OPCs also move towards the cortex. So to really understand what would be the function uh, of these uh, early born OPCs um, during interneuron migration, uh, we decided to use a genetic strategy uh, that allows us to visualize uh, cells that uh, express the LX56 that are interneurons and at the same time uh, eliminate uh, uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And what we observed is that uh, when we deplete these early born OPCs, you have a significant reduction of interneurons migrating in the marginal zone, but also in the other corridor uh, of the intermediate zone. And you, you have here the quantification. Uh, so we observed these in many, many animals. And uh, when we looked at a later stage, uh, the number of interneurons in the cortical plate uh, remains uh, lower. And if you look at uh, this uh, marginal stream, you even see an aggregation of, in, of the interneurons. So if I can give you a detail, um, some uh, somatostatin interneurons that will leave their axon uh, in layer one, they take up uh, this corridor. And uh, 
So what we believe is that, in fact, these OPCs are very important for uh, the migration of the somatostatin interneurons down in the cortical plate. And in their absence, in fact, you are um, impairing their movement in the cortical plate. And this is really interesting. And I will follow up um, this work now in my lab. So then we decided to do some live imaging. Uh, and what you see here, this is a brain slice of the, the embryo. And in green, you have interneurons and in white blood vessels uh, that are present in the tissue. And we decided to label the blood vessels because the vessels are the substrate of migration of OPCs. And as you can see here, the interneurons cannot really avoid blood vessels because uh, the vessels are in the middle of the tissue. But you can also appreciate that they don't, uh, they are not sticking to the vessels, they are just passing by. However, when you deplete uh, the first wave OPCs, what happens is that the interneurons now are uh, extremely attracted to the vessels and they will even uh, collide and deform uh, the vasculature. And we quantified this here. So in these graphs, the, the time zero is the time in which an interneuron interacts with the vessel. So in a normal situation, uh, the interneuron will progress quickly, will move away from the vessel, but when you deplete OPCs, it will stick to the vasculature. And we have the same phenotype uh, with by inducing the OPC detachment. So instead of depleting the OPCs, if we just if we use drugs uh, that will interfere with OPC migration uh, on the vessels, we observe the same phenotype. So an arrest of the interneurons on the vasculature. So of course we put the hypothesis that uh, the interneurons and the OPCs would be competing. Uh, for the same molecule. Uh, and uh, we know that the interneurons are attracted uh, by 6L12 that is uh, released by intermediate progenitors, but the blood vessels and the endothelial cells also release some 6L12. And both interneurons and OPCs express the receptors for these chemokines. So basically what is happening uh, is that the two cell types are in competition for 6L12 but the OPCs could conquer the blood vessels and by a mechanism that I will explain later on, they can keep the source of 6L12 for themselves, forcing the interneurons to use the 6L12 that is released by cortical progenitors. And to prove that our interneurons are really attracted by 6L12, what we did was to use blocking antibodies uh, uh, against 6L12 and also 6L11. Um, that is another uh, factor that is released by the vasculature and recognized by 6CR4 and 7. And as you can see here in this graph, uh, by blocking 6L12, you rescue interneuron migration. Uh, and the same if you block 6L11. So this shows that uh, interneurons are attracted to the chemokines that are being released uh, by the endothelial cells. And it was very striking because as I showed you in the tissue, uh, the two cell populations do not really seem to interact, right? They are always uh, separated. So um, we went in vitro and we did some uh, co-cultures uh, of explants, so pieces of tissue containing interneurons that we labeled in uh, red. And we cultured these interneurons uh, in the presence of oligodendrocyte precursor cells um, that we labeled in green, uh, but we uh, prevented their interaction by a physical barrier. So all the gradients of molecules can cross from one side to the other, but the cells cannot interact. And as you can see here in this graph, the factors released by OPCs do not disturb um, the distribution of interneurons around the core of the explant, suggesting that, in fact, uh, it's not the secretome of OPCs that is influencing the interneurons um, in the, on vessels. So what we did next was to co-culture uh, the two cells, uh, the two cell populations, uh, but allowing, allowing them to interact. So that's what you see here. Here you have 
a piece of explant of containing interneurons that is cultured um, in front of a piece of tissue that had OPCs that then started migrating a little bit. And uh, as you can see here, the interneurons cannot cross uh, this barrier formed by OPCs. And uh, in animals in which we depleted the first wave OPCs, the interneurons could move all along to conquer these territories uh, that have no longer OPCs. So then we explored, we went further on the signaling and we did more uh, live imaging. And what you see here in green is an OPC and in red an interneuron. And you see beautifully that the OPC extends some philopodia that will recognize the interneuron and then it will uh, induce a repulsion of the interneuron. So there is really a physical interaction that is very specific after the recognition of the interneuron. And uh, this uh, physical uh, repulsion interaction is no longer present when you deplete plexin A3 uh, on interneurons. So plexin A3 uh, is uh, the receptor for uh, semaphorin uh, 6. So uh, we described for the first time that uh, semaphorin 6 uh, is able to bind uh, and act on plexin A3 receptor. Uh, so this is a novel mechanism. And in terms of cell biology, we also found something uh, that is really interesting is that um, upon contact repulsion, as you can see here in this scheme, you have the generation of a new leading process that will dictate the new direction of the interneuron even before the mobilization uh, of the center organizing microtubules. So this is very peculiar and uh, we are still intrigued on how uh, we can have the formation uh, in this direction. So we, we still don't know if there is intervention of other actors or other uh, types of cytoskeleton in the formation of this uh, initial uh, uh, cellular process. So this is under investigation. Um, so basically, uh, to, to summarize what is happening, and now I will put it in the context of the tissue, uh, you see here our embryonic brain slice. And you see that uh, the proliferative regions uh, in the, of the embryonic brain can gener generate the two population of cells, so the OPCs and the interneurons. And the OPCs will take up blood vessels, preventing our interneurons from interacting with 6L12. And this is very important because interneurons must move to the cortex, right? And they need to find the sources of 6L12 from the cortex. So in fact, these uh, early born OPCs are very important in organizing the migration of interneurons towards the cortex. And uh, what is also beautiful is that these OPCs are extremely selective. So they are just uh, performing this contact repulsion with early born uh, interneurons, but they will not help late born interneurons to reach the cortex. So um, you probably don't know, but uh, during development, the, the interneurons that are generated by the medial ganglionic eminence, they start moving first, and the ones generated later by the caudal ganglionic eminence, they are uh, moving later. So maybe a mechanism that is uh, allowing this uh, distinction between uh, or discrimination in time um, are oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And this is really interesting. So what I'm doing now, it's uh, trying to go further in mechanisms, but also trying to find ways to not deplete the OPCs uh, because in our mouse model, uh, the embryos die at birth. So uh, I'm trying to find other ways to impair uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, migration on vessels, uh, or preventing this interaction uh, in vivo to study what happens postnatally when you disturb this communication between interneurons and OPCs. And what I expect to see is uh, a precocious invasion of the cortex by late-born um, interneurons.
And um, yeah, so these are the questions that I am exploring. Uh, and uh, I would like to highlight Fanny. She was my student in uh, Belgium. She did an amazing, uh, amazing work. Uh, and of course, Laurent and uh, Karsten that were there uh, all along. And now I am in the uh, Netherlands and I will pursue exploring these questions. And I would be very happy to answer to your questions if you have some. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I um one thing that I, I'm hoping since I have an expert that you can just help me um understand some some basic things. I realized that I don't know about how migration is working in the brain. Um yeah. do these do the neurons do they have integrins and are they, you know, can I apply my sort of like standard grab and pull model for how these cells are migrating or is it a different mechanism or you know is there a lot of matrix there that they're binding to? I know this is like very very basic, but I'm I realized that I don't know while so you were talking you have, you have forces of adhesion so if you plate uh, your these cells in a dish they can also uh, move but you need to use appropriate substrate so for example if you if you use uh, polylysine they will not migrate but if you make them move in uh, polyornithine they will move <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's very <laughs> it's very They're very uh, sensitive to their environment it's very, then. It's, it's very sensitive but um, basically what's triggering them are gradients of, uh, of molecules, but they will, of course, adhere to cells that they will encounter because they are moving between cells, right? So even the extension of the leading process depends on forces and stabilization of the, the, the leading process before the nucleus jumps for, uh, forward. So you for sure have adhesion, but what is really driving the directionality of the cell are uh, molecules that they are sensing in the in the medium, and right, for sure. Right. Okay. Into... Yeah, yeah. And I was just I was really struck while you were presenting all of this, thinking about you know the neurons reaching, grabbing out, and and imagining that there's a lot of forces that must be exerted by the migrating cell um, just to achieve what you're showing us. And so, is there any thought about what about the cells that are being pulled on? Is that a signal to them at all that, that you know, someone's <laughs> tugging on me? Does that matter? That is a great question, right? Um, imagine. I no idea. The... <laughs> it might be very silly. I'm not sure. No, 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 but you are right. But no one is studying that. It's extremely complex, right? Because the cells are in the middle of, uh, I mean, when we look uh, in detail, uh, so it, just by, by staining nucleus around these interneurons, it's full of cells all around. So they are probably interacting and you are far away from understanding all this communication. For example, what is happening during the pausing time, right? They are there maybe sensing a lot of things. Uh, signals from other cells, but these questions are extremely difficult to study in vivo, as you may understand. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't even imagine. I like simple systems because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> yes. No, and it's interesting because I think about you know this being individual cell processes, but I think there's inherent collectiveness that I never appreciated before. Um, sorry, I'm going to move on. Um, we have a question in the chat from um, Swathi Radha and Ankita. You can go next. Um, uh, they're asking, um, thank you for the talk. <clears throat> and excuse me. How did you identify the SEMA6 plexin as the main interactors? Um, yes, <laughs> it was complex. So we went through a single cell RNA sequencing uh, database and it was a candidate approach, right? We did some uh, trials with the main, because we first observed that it was a contact repulsion, right? So you have some families that are already known by mediating contact repulsion. But then the classes of these, uh, of these uh, receptors and ligands, we went through a single cell databases and we chose, uh, I think, 15 candidates, but SEMA6 was the less, uh, the less expressed. So it was the last candidate that we tested, in fact, um, because this is a, a new mechanism, right? So we didn't know that SEMA6 could bind to Plexin A3. Uh, but it can in these cells. So it really shows how specific is this biological process. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I actually had a connected uh, question to that. Um, so do you know if plexin sort of expression changes when the cells are, you know, away from the initial invasion point? 
Yeah, that um, is an excellent uh, uh, question. Um, we did some uh, RNA sequencing, um, and uh, but in in our RNA sequencing, we we didn't discriminate cells and their position within the mm -hmm. migration. So so we cannot really tell. Mm -hmm. For that, we would need to to make sections uh, at different uh, lengths of the cortex, right? Yeah. And analyze the expression of these uh, these plexins in in cells that just started migrating, and compare to cells that migrated already a lot. And so maybe, maybe I don't understand how are they moving forward. Like I understand there is a gradient for CXCL twelve, yes. but yes. is it is it such a gradual gradient as such, or like I, I'm just trying to visualize it. Mm -hmm. How are they moving from their initial point to like I understand the repulsion, but mm -hmm. how is it pushing them forward? It, it's a pity that I didn't uh, show a picture here, but. So in uh, you see my mouse, right? Yeah, yeah so I do. I'm pointing to the cortex. So more or less in this region, you have intermediate progenitor cells mm -hmm. that are dividing locally. So they so they will always be residing uh, here, right? And at okay. the same time, they are releasing six cell twelve. So if you do an in situ hybridization, you will really see a gradient of six cell twelve here in this region. Ah, oh, okay. So they it forms really a corridor. So if you go on literature and uh, on papers and uh, and see six L twelve gradient in cortical development, you will find a nice picture of this. So it really forms a corridor here that will guide your cells. So in the ganglionic eminences, you just have the endothelial cells that are releasing some six L twelve, but the, that source is covered by the OPCs. So um, they will start moving, and when they will move, they will sense the gradient, and they will uh, follow. So do you think there's a role for contact guidance, for just sort of topographical-based guidance as well? Uh, you mean the interneurons uh, interacting with each other? Yeah, you know, just as you were describing the, the idea of a corridor, you know, it makes me think that the, the cells may have a sort of a physical... Um, Hugh just saying, you know, go in this direction so, or go along uh, this path. Um, so we we checked a little bit interactions, for example, with uh, between interneurons, and they don't interact at all uh, amongst mm. them. Uh, they are quite independent in their movement, but we cannot exclude that they could be interacting with other cell types, but we are not visualizing these cells. That's the problem. Right. Uh, but uh, for example, in my, if I display here, uh, I, will, uh, I wanted to show you my, sorry. I need to go to the beginning. Um, I know I don't have it here. I'm really sorry. I had an image no, 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 no. A zoom of an interneuron um, that is passing through the intermediate progenitors of the cortex while moving. Uh, and they they really have the processes intermingled. So I cannot uh, exclude that there are physical forces and interactions also acting. Uh, and it would mm. be beautiful to, to study, but also so complex at the same time, right? Because if you even think of doing some manipulations on, on the, the progenitor cells, you might mm -hmm. also influence the process of division, cell division, right? right? So... Yeah. You have a very complex interplay where everything's yes. depending on everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That's um. I, when I was an undergrad, I realized that neuroscience was too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> we do small steps, step by step, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different level, right, of complexity. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right, I, I noticed. Oh, yeah, I'll get to I it. had a quick one question, and I know you sort of like, um, what you know, I, I was just wondering again, I don't know much about the neurobiology field, like in terms of the extracellular matrix there, where you have your first wave, second wave, and third wave, like in terms of ECM composition, do people already know what kind of differences are there? No, no, no one is really looking at that, and uh, it should really be investigated, right? So, nobody like biopsied like parts of it. and... <laughs> No one is uh, studying that uh, in uh, in um, 
during development. There is a lot of study of extracellular matrix uh, in adulthood during uh -huh. uh, synaptic plasticity, mm -hmm. but it's a great idea to study that during um, during migration. In fact, yeah, yes, awesome. Thank you so much. Those are such like yeah something we don't think so much about, and it's awesome to really? hear such talk. <laughs> I feel like in cell migration, we have our sort of our few model systems that we're all really focused on. And then you come along and say, hey, brains are important too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we start a lot of these talks saying that cell migration is so important in a lot of physiological and pathological processes. And then, yes. of course, it is like during development is such an important thing. Yes. Super cool. But uh, very complex also to study right in a yeah. tissue. <laughs> Yes. All right. I'll, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, sign off on the, um, the, the YouTube. So for everyone watching there, see you guys.